and she, I think she said the same thing. I didn't realize how funny the show was. Um, because people think of it as with the sad parts, right? Which are the evident ones, but it's very, very charming and very funny, um, which we were thrilled to find out, you know, when we started getting audiences in New York that they appreciated that. Uh, you know, some of the characters like Amy is hysterical. You know, she's just, <laughs> she's so out there. Um, but, and Joe is as well. Uh, one of my favorite, favorite lines that Amy says, and we always cracked up in rehearsal after Joe gets her hair cut. And uh -huh. Amy goes, oh, Joe, that was your best feature. <laughs> <laughs> completely oblivious, always completely oblivious to other people's feelings, you know, until, until much later. It feels like everyone's doing that show right now. Uh, everyone is doing it. There's someone else is doing it as well. They just told me, yeah, it's suddenly, popped up it's a very good holiday show it it well has a little christmas in it so that's always helpful um you know oh, there's there's another hilarious moment when when she drags in the christmas tree that she chopped down without anyone's permission you know? <laughs> <laughs> and she comes in dragging this tree you know and it was joe what she said i just you know just borrowed it well you know you can't borrow a tree once you've chopped it down it's yours uh, Anyway, but it's that that kind of uh, delightful character um, specific humor. You know, one of Joe's characteristics as she grows up and she learns is she's headstrong. She goes at things first and thinks about them second sometimes, you know, and the chopping down of the tree is a perfect example of that. She doesn't think through the consequence. You know, she's so uh, headstrong and, uh, you know, delightful that way. So I'm glad you're pleased with your cast because I think, as I always do, that it's at least 50% of a director's job. There's a quite talented acting pool here in Duluth. And um, of course we got hundreds of submissions for Joe March. Everyone wants to play Joe March. And it's just like, how do you... Right. Everyone can sing it. So then it's about something different than just the voice. Right, right. It's it. She's really, um, and, and of course she has a, they, all the, girls do but joe specifically has a real journey in the show um and she grows up you know essentially she grows up before our eyes from the impetuous person she is to a kind of very um thoughtful and despondent person and has to be pulled out of that despondency uh when things don't go her way when things don't go the way she thought they would in life you know she in the beginning she's so clear about how she wants her life to be and how she wants her family to be when she realizes that basically she's making decisions for other people um it's <laughs> difficult and then of course the loss of Beth on top of that she has so many um huge emotional issues to deal with she loses Beth she loses Lori essentially as the person who worshipped her unconditionally and suddenly she feels terribly alone Till she realizes that she's not and that you know then in comes of course um you know her friend from new york and uh, what do you think it is about this show that like it gets produced a lot like it's had quite a legacy after broadway um, it became the most produced show in north america when it became when the stock and amateur rights became available wow interesting yeah you know it's it, 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 it truthfully it got what we refer to you euphemistically as lackluster reviews in New York. When it went on the road, just the opposite. All the road reviews were stellar. And we opened on the West Coast. And I think we didn't we didn't open it all. We opened it Orange County, but the LA Times reviewed it. And the LA Times critic really took the New York critics to task. I remember distinctly. Um, because he said, this is not the show I'm looking at. And it was the same show. We did, we made no significant changes to the tour at all. Um, I think, you know, as we all know in New York, things are very much timely or not timely. In New York, I had a feeling that the critics were not ready for another show with girls in long skirts. They wanted something modern and edgy and, you know, they didn't want anything that smacked even slightly of tradition. So that was very, very interesting. I mean, we got a number of nominations and various things, but that's sort of beside the point. 
But really when it went on tour, it took off around the country. Um, and as I said, once the stock and I'm sure were, rights were released, it really took off as a show that everybody wanted to do. And some theaters, because I get the royalty reports, some theaters do it every year. Oh, wow. As sort of the holiday show, you know, people get a little tired of Christmas Carol. So let's do something, you know, <laughs> a little different that still draws a family, a family audience. Uh, and the other thing we found about this show is that it really did draw an audience across generations because it, it not only did it have the title, you know, we, in the business, we call it an A title, which is a title that everyone knows, right? So it had an A title, but it also had what we call the song. You know, um, when you think of Wicked, what do you think of? You think of Defying Gravity, right? When yep. you think of Little Women, you think of Astonishing. I mean, there was a time when uh, I would be at auditions and every woman would sing Astonishing. Uh, you know, people also think of it as a show that has many good roles for women, which it does, but it also has some terrific roles for men. You know, it's a small cast, but it's still, the roles for young men are really, really good. And uh, also Laurie's song also became very popular. Take a Chance on Me became very popular as an audition piece for young men too. But it's mainly the story that draws people. I mean, it has been an iconic classic for so long and a positive influence on young women as far as developing into an independent spirited female person in which in a difficult world in which that wasn't always easy to be or do right so it it, it, it is that she's a joe is a role model that way for a yeah. lot of young women i think that's why everybody wants to play joe right um she's just the the first of those accessible young women who went out and got what she wanted in life, you know, and got it her way. Yeah, it's interesting when we work on when we've been rehearsing. Um, one of the things that we had to overcome was like all of us put Joe on a pedestal, and we all make her just this like golden person that every. And then, and then the more you actually rehearse the show, you're like, oh, she's she's, she's complicated, and she's got some. You no, know, she's she's flawed. She's definitely flawed as a young one. One of the things is her headstrong nature. She doesn't take criticism at all, right? She's very defensive. She doesn't want, she thinks she works hard. She works very hard. She's not lazy at all. She works very hard at everything she does. But then if somebody critiques it, she's not a good taker of criticism at all. Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> she's extremely defensive, um, which is something she learns. I mean, she even, a little bit of it even hangs on with Marmy in that very emotional scene in act two, when Marmy tries to pull her out of her despondency. It's, and she sort of goes after Marmy and Marmy in a way that's a little insensitive. Marmy comes right back at her. I mean, she's her mom's daughter um, <laughs> that way. And uh, Marmy does not let her get away with it. But, um, but she is flawed. And one of the wonderful things about that is to see her develop and grow up and understand more about human nature and more about the world does not revolve around me, right? Yeah. Which, which is a very young people's problem, right? The, they become the center, they believe the center of the universe and to say, hey, the world doesn't actually revolve around you. It's a hard concept for a young person. And she learns it the hard way. She learns it with real significant loss. I mean, Beth is her baby. She says it. She says it in the show. When you were born, I told mommy, Beth is mine. Mm -hmm. Which is such- It's such know, a good line. Such a line. Um, I get choked up just, you know. So let me ask you something. Are you able to direct some things are meant to be without them crying? <laughs> <laughs> um <clears throat> definitely the first couple times no and then um same thing with the same thing with days of plenty that was like emotional for people too but um right yeah but then we just you know chatted about the audience can cry <laughs> right exactly oh it was it was very difficult first of all in in the broadway production the first production sutton and megan were friends oh. so so joe and and uh beth were friends outside of theater. So it became doubly difficult. I mean, I would have to say, all right, ladies, come on. All right. <laughs> you know, 
think other thoughts. I don't know yeah. what it is, but we've got yeah. to get through this, you know. Um, and uh, of course, they're pros. They eventually did, but it was not easy. I remember when that song was that song was went through a conversion. It yeah. was mainly um, it was mainly Beth's song, and then it became a duet, and then the little coda was added to it at the end, which is the real killer. So it, the development of it, uh, of the song, was uh, was very interesting to watch that happen over, you know, a time in workshops and readings. We wanted it to be, look, it's going to be sad. There's nothing you can do about it, right? We love Beth. We don't want her to die. It's going to be sad. But we also wanted it to be clear that she had come to terms with this. In a way, Beth is very strong underneath all of that, you know, baby girl thing she's very strong she's come to terms with this before anybody mm -hmm. but she is she has she has a i don't want to call it fatalism but she has a knowledge that she's only on this earth for so long she knows it and um and she's come to terms with it which is where her strength lies we, we would talk in rehearsal about how it's interesting that in that scene beth almost seems like the older sister at that point because she's so much wiser than than Joe in that moment. And Joe yes. accept what reality is. Yeah. Well see that's again, that's that's Joe, right? I can change it. I don't care what's real. I can make it different. Right. Well some things are meant to be, some things you cannot change. And that's a huge lesson for her. I love Marmy's song when she talks about how, basically how to deal with it. And um, that kills me too. That's, that was very late arriving tune as well. But again, Marmy, you know, you look at each of the girls and you see Marmy, a bit of Marmy in each of them, right? And, and um, that I'm so, was so pleased when she was tough with Joe there, you know? Yeah. Um, and she is, she is throughout. She's not a, you know, Marmy's no pushover and she's somewhere along the line, each of the girls hear it from her <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in one way or another. And, and, you know, again, the song where she basically talks about raising the girls by herself, you know, she was a single mom of four girls during the civil war, essentially. Right. Right. So. Yeah. She had to be strong. I, every time, every time a line reminds us that the war is going on throughout the story, I'm always like, "Don't mm -hmm. pass that! Don't, D don't, don't, don't overlook that!" You know, we use the sound, we use the bells, you know, in in uh, in Concord. Um, they told the bells every time somebody died from the area. The church bell told mm -hmm. with the number, adding the number on. So we use that in one section i can't remember exactly where because it's an ominous tolling you know yeah and and also to remember in that time in the civil war people went to war in their um home regiments so they'd be the conquered regiment they'd be the the massachusetts conquered regiment they would be together in the war so they they knew each other and and that was all like the Virginia or something re regiment. That's how people were enlisted during the Civil War. So they were very much in with their neighbors and friends and sometimes siblings. Was there ever a uh, version of the musical when it was being developed where the father was in the show? Yes. It was not a good idea. Yeah. We've had some people comment on our stuff on social media saying what the dad's not in it the dad doesn't come home and you know it's not his story it's not yeah it's not his story it's called little women betray the title at your own risk yeah i mean we're not doing the book that's the other thing i tell people we're not doing the book we're doing a four-year period in the book and um and that was a choice um because we can't do the book how can you put the you can never put a classic book on stage. You can't do that. I mean, I guess you can, maybe, I don't know, but um, we did not choose to do that. We chose to put the four years in which the most iconic moments occurred in Joe's life. And by iconic, I mean the most emotional 
because it's a musical. So you want to have moments that sing, right? And um, we found that if in this four year period or four and a half year period, that's where most of the highly emotional material uh, lived. And that's what we chose. That's how we chose that. And, you know, when you adapt, adapt, a, adapt a classic, you can't, you cannot please everyone because everyone remembers it the way they want to remember it personally. Yeah. Because the thing about adaptation is you want to be respectful, but not slavish. Right. I think Little Women does a good job of that because it's a novel that was written in 1868 about like 63 through 65, but the musical was early 2000s and sounds yeah. quite contemporary actually. Yeah. And, and, and purposefully, purposefully, you know, we talk about, and you know this, Wes, with, with new shows, especially in, with every show, we talk about the fact that they exist in three time zones, right? They exist in the time zone in which they're set. Okay, so this is set in the 1850s, whatever. All right, so that's, this, that's one time zone. Then there's a time zone in which it was written, and then it's the time zone in which it's performed. Right, so there are three different times, each of which needs to receive proper attention. Right, if you're doing the show today, it's very different than when we did it. Even just, you know, when did it premiere? <laughs> you know, two thousand and five. Two thousand and five. Right. Okay. So two thousand and five, very different than two thousand, almost twenty three. Mm -hmm. Different times. Yeah. A lot of things have happened. Right. Yeah. Let, so um, that's something that the director, as you well know, has to pay attention to. But we also felt that we wanted to do the show in a timeless way. So our set was always non-traditional. We never had a literal, literal looking set. Our costumes were period costumes, but we made certain um, adjustments. We didn't want to put hoop skirts on the girls. We didn't want to do things that were we we'll use a hoop skirt only what way later when they should come amy comes back from france and uh, aunt march i think were the only two who wore a hoop skirt and that was way at the end of the show again to keep to not make put any barriers between a modern audience and the people on stage and the thing about adjusting to period two is that you also don't want to be slavish to period you know there are certain adjustments you can make like you know what how much furniture would be in a house? A lot. We didn't want a lot. Because <laughs> you have you to know. bring it on and take it off. <laughs> right, exactly. You put it on, you got to get it off. But also, I, to me, furniture suffocates a musical. So I'm always like, what do I need? I need a sofa and a piano. Fine. That's all I need. And, yeah. um, you know, whatever. Uh, but, but things like that to give, so it feels modern you're also trying to resonate emotions in ways that would a woman in 1850 speak her emotional mind the way Marmy does? Right. Well, it, right? No, probably not. But would she have had those thoughts? Probably. So we can take the thoughts, though. We have the liberty to take those thoughts and then put them out there in a musical. You mentioned generations earlier on, and one um, someone just commented on a Facebook post that we did that said they have four generations of women coming to see our production, which I thought was like so cool. And I think this idea of timelessness also allows for that. Yeah, you know, um, Louisa May Alcott, our author, she grew up in a very progressive household. So her, you know, her dad was a teacher, a transcendentalist which was a very, you know, out there philosophy at the time. So she grew up in a very, very educated household, right? And, and a very, for want of a better word, much more bohemian than uptight New Englanders. A lot of, new, so there was a lot of uh, personal growth and freedom allowed that didn't necessarily exist elsewhere. So that's, so that's where Louise May Alcott comes from, you know, um, and, um, that is what, where she invests Joe with that kind of, you know, liberalism. You can tell that she wasn't brought up to 
keep her mouth shut, right? <laughs> be seen and not heard. That was not part of the way. And also Marmy says that too. I want my girls to be who they are. I want you to grow up to be the best possible version of you, right? And this is very, that's, that's very modern. You know, that does not, that does not go away. So it would be wonderful. Yeah, I saw, we would see all the time, three generations coming to the theater. We'd see mommy, daughter, and grandma, and grandpa too, you know, and the, the guys as well. But, um, and that's wonderful. It's wonderful if you can speak to generations like that. There's so few shows can do that. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with that as well. There's, there are, as you go into show selection, there seem to be fewer and fewer musicals <laughs> out there. And then if you start to narrow it down to ones that you can bring the entire family to come see and everyone will thoroughly enjoy it, um, there's only a handful really that kind of fit that bill. Right. I think that's right. I think it is hard to find shows that um, speak to many generations at one time. Um, and um and carry the kind of emotional weight that something like this show does. You know, we're very fortunate, I think, to have um, been able to do the national tour and get out across the country um, and see the reaction across the country to the show and um, realize that it was kind of universal. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. I, what else? Is, I think I have one final question. I think, uh, do you have any advice for the cast and crew at Duluth oh, <laughs> as we go into uh, our tech week? Yeah, the only thing, the only advice is the advice I give constantly is to trust the material. Trust the material. Uh, I, I, I will say that it is there for you. It is all there. Um, it trusts the music. Trust the, the, the dialogue, trust the character um, growth and development. It's all there. Um, and, um, and I think try to avoid sentimentality. It's, it, you know, the kind of sentiment we want to evoke will happen. It is, it's, it's, it's no, as you said, you don't cry, the audience will be crying. Trust me. Um, don't play into that. Play into just the opposite. These are not whiny characters. They're strong New Englanders, right? And, uh, and they're survivors. Um, so uh, I think, uh, and, 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 and also to trust the, I think this show has some of the best lyrics of any new show I've ever worked with. And I think you really need to bite into the, those lyrics because it's very melodic as well. So when a show is very melodic, sometimes young actors have a tendency to sing the score as opposed to sing the lyrics. You know what I'm saying, right? Um, and I'm always saying, there are words here. These words are very meaningful and very, very carefully chosen. So, uh, Mindy was a very, very good lyricist and they're very particular to character as well, which is great, you know, I think. So that's, you know, that's my only advice. <laughs>